the circuit court when I was in Mullingar, like a long time ago. It used to sit regularly in Mullingar, providing an in-your-face view of the tiger's underbelly, the Celtic tiger. The invisible poor who didn't often show their faces in public. They got out for the day. The underclass who have long been excluded from society, who move in deep water like sly fish. The good, the bad, and the beautiful. Nasty little dealers who survive in shadowed alleyways, loitering in the toilets of nightclubs, or floating through working class areas in their metallic autos, sleek as a shark's fin. Broken hearted mothers, victims of alcohol, tobacco, natural infections, or abusing partners. Children who have taken to the hood, the hoodies, the society of the street corner, like monks once took to the cowl and the cloister. These hoodies in particular are the lost brotherhood of modern Ireland. Boys with no maps. Boys with no vocation. Boys whose instincts tell them they are warriors, but whose society tells them to go away because they don't talk right or spell right. And it's a sad circus in the courtroom. A circus that assembles on the steps of the courthouse every few weeks a stone building adjacent to the Mullingar Arts Centre. The court provides an alternative theatre and an alternative culture to the happy musicals across the road. I arrived at around 11 o'clock. There were barristers in black gowns and white collars, solicitors in smart grey suits, and other advisers and consultants in expensive overcoats, bibs and wigs, and impeccable mascara. The main door was thronged with gaunt, junky types, and small, stout women smoking like trains. Haggard and dried-out faces, beetroot cheeks with purple cobwebs, arms tattooed, with love and hate. I pushed through the door. Guards stared at me as if I was another thief on my first day at school. Hooded faces of the poor studied me as if they were trying to remember my features for later encounters. Inside, grown men stood without shame in their prison clothes, their wrists handcuffed to prison officers. Everyone squeezed into the courtroom. Thirty-two barristers in flowing black robes and Garda superintendents in cool blue. And at the very back of the room, on steps beneath the balcony, I waited with the unwashed hoodies and the worn-out mothers. The judge was grumpy, but meticulous. He scrutinised details as best he could, but delivered justice as if he was working against the clock. The bewilderment in the eyes of the poor mothers beside me was metaphysical. The lean hoodies at my shoulder had the visceral attention of half-starved whippets an animal alertness across their faces. And I got a bit nervous, you know. I've only felt this nervousness on the platform of late-night trains in Mumbai and Naples. Be 
because I was saying to myself, like, I have nothing against hoodies. Some of my best friends have children. But these were definitely not the huggable type. Later that evening, I went to the cinema. There were a few young boys, lanky and shy, loitering outside the door, drifting up and down along the windows of Harvey Normans, gazing in at digital televisions. Their innocent faces reminded me of the bicycle shed in St. Patrick's College in Cavan during the late sixties. Country boys on bikes would arrive on a windy day, their bushy hair tossed like haystacks in a hurricane. There they would spend a sad half-hour before class, licking their fringes and combing them into the correct wave of beetle cool. Anyway, the cinema was packed, and the hoodies took up a, a position on the left lower flank of the raked seating. They were more interested in James Bond's car than any woman on the screen. The iconic Austin Martin gathered them all into one collective sigh of admiration. When Bond's car confronted a tied-up woman on the road, they were horrified. Not that the woman might die, but that in a split second a bond might damage his wheels. She lay on the road, terrified, like a rabbit facing headlamps. James avoided killing her, but his car spun out of control and was instantly wrecked. One little fellow could not contain himself any longer. Fuck that, he shouted. I would have bombed straight into her. They were just giddy, but eventually they drew enough attention to themselves to get thrown out. As they passed me, I got the whiff of boss and other designer deodorants, and beneath the hoods there were still childish blushes on their soft faces. These guys don't have jeeps. Their hoods keep off the rain and wind as they walk home. I know, because I saw them later, huddled in the door of an off-license, and they've probably never seen the inside of a courtroom. Yet. That reflection is from about 15 years ago. So the young lads that I was looking at on that evening in the cinema, maybe they were, maybe they were 15 years of age then, so they're 30 years of age now. Where do you think they are? Well, I, I'll tell you, I don't know but I don't think it would be right to say they're all in prison or something. In fact, there's one thing I've realised as I got older, an extraordinary way that young lads can be appalling when they're young, and then something happens to them, and it's like common sense kicks in, and they change their life. And I've seen it, I've seen it in friends. I've seen it when I was growing through in my 30s, and I suppose I was, up until my early 30s, I was completely irresponsible in some senses. I had spent 20, oh, b between the ages of 20 and 30, I had spent either in Maynooth or as a, an ordained priest, so... When I, be, when I was 31, I thought I'd, I'd kind of make up for lost time. And, um, you know, I, I just relished a bit of wildness and a bit of drinking and a bit of argument. I never was, you know, I never was somebody who'd be in a physical fight, but 
I just loved verbal arguments. God, I could stay up all night if there was an argument. And in those days, to be fair as well, people used to enjoy arguments. You know, it, it, it didn't feel that you were possessed by the truth. So let's say the arguments and discussions were around, oh, I don't know, feminism, should there be women priests or something? And you'd have two sides of it. And sometimes you'd be arguing for, yes, there should be women priests and there should be, you know, all sorts of liberation in the church and in education. And you'd find yourself maybe maybe being persuaded by the other person's point of view. And then a month later or a week later, you'd be in another discussion in a different pub and you'd find yourself arguing the opposite side. And it was like, Arguing two different sides helped you probe the nuances of each different argument. And it wasn't unlike what they used to do in medieval universities. Do you know where discourse, the word discourse, it used to mean a sort of an exploration of the truth by presenting two different sides of an argument. So the idea was that the truth will declare itself if we engage in a process of finding the truth and the way that we find the truth is that we we create an adversarial discourse whereby somebody proposes a thesis and somebody argues against it and that idea of proposing something and then arguing against it you find it in the medieval church you find it in situations where people are what they used to call the devil's advocate in fact you know so so the devil's advocate was to in some sense in an exorcism or in a case of heresy somebody would defend the heretic and they would be in a sense an advocate for the devil's point of view but the process was there to find the truth to hear both sides of the argument or the discussion and then that would have moved in the 11th century or suppose into formal universities across Europe when the universities were really developing as sort of institutions in themselves they would have the same discourse so if you were doing a PhD you you presented your PhD sometimes to a panel of experts and professors who would then argue against you whatever the thesis was whatever the idea was you were putting forward a panel of experts would argue against you your own professors and you would have to defend your thesis and it was called defending the thesis if you could defend it cogently and very well you might get high marks and if you couldn't defend it at all, I suppose, you might not get your PhD. So the idea of argument, the idea of discourse, was going on as a, like it was, a, it was a fine way to explore the truth. And it kind of reflected some kind of yin and yang, electron and proton, yes and no, left and right, you know. It wasn't either side was the truth. It was the process of the discussion would find the truth. They used to say that if you were striving in an argument and you kind of lost your temper, you were no longer striving for the truth, you were striving for yourself. And that was always the danger because if you were talking in a discourse, in an argument, about some idea, let's say, is there a God, or, you know, should, I can't imagine medieval arguments, but, you know, is, is Luther correct to challenge the church? Supposing there was some debate going on like that, well, you could be arguing cogently for one side or the other, but if you were going to lose in your temper, they would say that you were no longer striving for the truth, you were striving for yourself, because you were getting too involved in the argument. You were actually getting too emotionally attached 
to your argument as if your argument was the right point of view absolutely whereas in fact the idea was you were putting forward an argument and balancing it against the opposite argument to see which was the truth and you, that, that, that went into law as well so that you ended up with an adversarial system right through the legal tradition a solicitor or a barrister might stand up and he might be making very cogent and coherent arguments in defence of somebody that he or she privately considered guilty of the murder. But their job was not to, and is not, to invest their own emotions and points of view in the process. Their job in the process is to present the argument, and in that sense they're like the devil's advocate. And it's it's a liberating thing. I always find it liberating if you think about argument or discussion like that, that, that it's not one person who's telling the truth or who has the truth. It It comes gradually in time. It's like the way a judge has to be employed to listen to both arguments and then to consider it and reflect on it and take his time or her time and then eventually come to a, a judgment. And the same would be true for the jury system or you're asking a, a group of reasonable people to weigh up the two sides. And you trust the fact that if you get 12 reasonable people who unanimously or collectively or by majority come to a decision, we go with this argument, this is the right argument, the guy is guilty or the guy is, is not guilty. You kind of trust it as the truth. That's the truth. That becomes the truth. It becomes the truth in law. So, I like this idea of... Uh, arguing and being in discourse and I used to do it when I was in my 20s but then in my 30s I lost the run of myself and I would really start enjoying myself and I'd be looking for every argument that was going and I probably used to tip over the, the balance sometimes so that I was arguing not for the truth really but for myself I was pushing my own and it's because you, you emotionally identify with the truth. And that's a really interesting kind of thing. You know, that the, the truth, in some sense, is not just an intellectual reality. And people tend to get involved with an intellectual position, but they get involved emotionally. And this is like, y you see it everywhere in Western culture at the moment. There are culture wars going on and there's polemics and arguments about so many issues and so many people are just really more and more getting emotionally involved. And I, people say that Twitter and social media encourage that sort of emotional involvement because there's no space for lengthy discourse. I don't agree with that because, okay, the lengthy discourse that people used to have was, was in universities and places like that where you could have debating societies. And there too, there was, you know, a formal process whereby the house the debating society would propose, you know, that this house, you know, supports the legitimacy of, let's say, Israel to exist. And then you'd get three speakers in favour of the motion and then you'd get three speakers against the motion. And the idea was that they would use the skill of good debating and, and they would push ideas and arguments that were intellectual to, to persuade the the audience, the house, of their point of view. And when you'd heard the for and against, people voted and decided 
by a majority vote what the House was deciding. And that's democracy too. You'll, you'll see it, the adversarial system in the British House of Parliament. Now, you could say that in the present day, because of social media and Twitter and because there's no kind of extensive time to tease out ideas, that that's why people are getting so emotionally involved in intellectual or political positions. And I disagree with that because I think that there's plenty of places. You know, podcasts, for example, are wonderful spaces of long discourse, long conversations. The only problem is that most of them have one point of view. So you might go in on a particular podcast which goes on for an hour or an hour and a half. And it might be an interview, but it's 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 presenting facts from one point of view. There seems to be less and less real discourse where the people are dispassionate from the ideas, where the people are are arguing to promote a particular idea, but they're not emotionally attached to that idea. They're they're proposing the idea in order to explore and find out the truth. And why does that happen? Well, I have my view on it. I think it's... There's some... Okay, I was going to say there's some lack of faith in people that causes this. Uh, But I come at it a different way. You see, truth is not just intellectual. It just doesn't satisfy us. It, we need to embody truth. And if, if you find out how to embody truth, it can be a very beautiful thing. It's like Tai Chi. It's like, you know, it, it's like standing in love with the beloved when you're in company with your beloved or with your child or with your mother or your father. Knowing their love is a physical experience, even if you don't touch. There's a strange way whereby you can feel in your body the truth of your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is not just in your brain. It's not just in your mind. It's in your your gut, in your feet, in your hands, in your arms. And I think that that's where the You know, Asian techniques are beautiful where they use Tai Chi and other sorts of, you know, formal rituals and mudras, they call them in in Buddhism. Mudras, which are kind of physical gestures or postures that you sit in or stand in that, that express something of your true nature, the flow of energy within you. And even the sense of flow of energy within you, you, you can't, You can't belong to that truth without physically allowing it to swallow you up and to embody itself in you. You know, the flow of energy. There's a flow of energy inside us. Okay, that's something you can't just hold in your head. You just have to move with it. Like in Tai Chi, you have to move with it. You have to feel the energy. You have to feel it moving through your wrists, your wrists moving out, stretching out your arms, either side of your body, and you feel, you feel as you move your wrists, your hands going up and down, they're like, they're like birds flying, and you, you feel the energy. You don't just know the energy in you. That's what, we're embodied creatures. It's like, it's like the most important thing you could ever realize the most important thing you could ever discover the most important thing you could ever hear today is that you are an embodied creature you're not a you're not a physical being with a bit of you that's conscious you're a spiritual being with a dimension that is physical. And this physicality, this 
it goes beyond your own body then and it, it embraces the air around you, the light around you, the landscape around you. Because you are one with it. You may you may define yourself. You may look at your hand. I look at my hand now and I see, oh look, that's a hand. It's it's sitting on the desk. It's beside the, the mug of coffee. But that's a separate hand, like that's that's my hand. And there's two things false about that. One is, God forbid if I lost my hand, I would still be me. So my hand is not entirely me. It's a bit of me, and every other bit of me is a bit of me. But, but the me inhabits my body, but It isn't necessary to have every single finger to be me. It isn't necessary to be young to be me. To be me is like this fluidity that embodies itself in physical form every second of the day. And it's as if it's as if every second of the day I embody myself anew. You know, my body is new as I wake up in the morning. And my body is new in this moment. And if in this moment I stayed still for a few seconds, my body would become, because my, my consciousness is just ticking over every second, every split, every nanosecond, every, every moment of being is a new moment of being. You feel your body. You feel your fingers, you feel your hands, you feel your toes, you feel your breath. And that physicality doesn't stop at your body, even though, as I say, when I put down my hand beside the cup of coffee, it looks like my hand, but, but really there's a kind of a, there's an interaction between those fingers and the air around it and the chemicals in the air and there's an interdependency in the big soup in the big physical soup that is around me and and maybe if I had a different type of of seeing a different type of eye I would just see a soup I wouldn't be able to even identify where my body is apart from it being some sort of density within a soup I don't see that. I just have this notion that I'm an individual. But but it really is what a lot of, you know, scientists say. I don't know, but I mean, I read scientists and they say interdependency is an essential aspect of how the human form exists within a larger soup of physicality. So if there is an aspect of us that knows anything, it's, it seems a kind of a necessary thing that it becomes embodied as well. It's like we just don't have, we don't have dismembered ideas. We, we don't have a bag somewhere with little things in it called ideas. It feels like that sometimes because linguistically there are structures in language. You know, there are there are shapes in language. There are all sorts of kind of ways whereby an idea comes to us as an abstract object. Even the word abstract, we understand what the word means and that's an intellectual you know, you have to get this, mathematics are abstract, but, but we, we conceive of them as concepts. And it's very easy to think about all the ideas then as abstract, as concepts, as things, as like, 
things that are sitting in some bag in my brain. And that's just not the way it works because, because eventually an idea needs embodiment. I suppose it's why you'll find it among a lot of young people now who talk about being activists and they're really using a template. What's, what's kind of nesting within the word activist is, is practice or praxis. In, in Marxist ideology, there were the ideas, the Marxist ideas, let's say about the oppressed, about conflict, about, you know, where history goes, pushes itself through conflict and struggle and becomes liberated. In, in, in all that stuff of history, from a Marxist point of view, it's important to have the idea and to have a clear idea. Let's say if you're talking about the liberation of a particular social group, you need to get the ideas clear. If you were thinking, let's say, of travellers and how they are, let's say, oppressed by systemic racism against them in the settled community, you need to get the ideas clear, but... You need to, what they say, do the work. You need to have a praxis. You need to have a practice. You need to have, be an activist. You need to be doing the idea, if you like. So it's like, it's like embodying the truth. If, if that's the truth, if that's how you see the truth, then it's a question of embodying the truth by your practice. And I think... And I love the... I don't know if you can hear the clock in the background. But I got it sort of steadied against the wall. It's about a metre high. It sits on a shelf. And it's an ancient old French clock. And Lord God, I love it. And it talks to me in the middle of the night. Like it really does. There'll be sometimes... Do you know when you wake up in the middle of the night? Well, sometimes I wake up, probably be light sleeping, and then in the distance, I'd be down in the bedroom, obviously, and this is my office, but, and in the distance, along the corridor, I'd hear the lovely chime of the bell. And it would tell me, without looking at the clock, it'll tell me, oh, it's four o'clock in the morning. But it doesn't disturb me, do you know? It's like someone said to me one time that you'll never be lonely in a house where there's a, a clock, meaning meaning a real clock, a clock that you wind up rather than a clock that has a battery in it. I'm talking about something that is a beautiful pendulum on it and sometimes it goes a little bit slow, sometimes a little bit fast and you have to kind of vary the pendulum. There's a little screw at the bottom of it, you can lengthen it or shorten it to make machine go faster or slower but but you can get it fairly precise and it's fairly precise at the moment and when I hear that I remember what a fellow said to me you'd never be lonely when you have a clock in the house because it's like it's like time is being marked out and I just find that almost mystical it's it's almost like it calls my attention to God. To be honest with you. it call, I think about the bells, you know, they used to have in the churches. And they called people's attention to God. And the six o'clock Angelus, it called people's attention to God. What, what we call now mindfulness. Mindfulness. The, the Angelus was a, a hugely beautiful, sophisticated and eloquent way of an entire community sharing mindfulness because at the same time every day they paid attention to God to transcendence and again they didn't pay attention to God as a concept like just as a little 
a little idea like a nugget in a bag in their brains. No, they actually did it by by entering into the narrative of Mary. Mary, who who allowed this child Jesus to be born in her, and who who watched him grow up, and then maybe maybe lost contact with him because he he certainly wasn't he wasn't around for about fifteen years, and then he turns up, he comes back, and he's ministering, and then he gets himself in trouble in Jerusalem, and and the next thing is she's standing there in the rain, or who knows, and she's looking at her lovely boy being tortured, being lashed, whipped. Then she's looking at, at somebody doing the sadistic joke of getting a huge big clump of thorns and crushing them into his skull so that the little thorns go through his, his scalp. She's watching him carry this huge big cross, as was the tradition in Roman Empire days, dragging the beam up the hill of Golgotha to to be nailed to it. She's watching him die. And then in that in that meditation we feel a kind of emotional affinity. I feel I've always had comfort in meditating on that little journey of the Via Dolorosa. I'm always thinking that when I'm sick, when I'm lonely, when I'm depressed, when when I've an ingrown toenail. You know, small things when you're getting older can affect you, can become cataclysmic. You know, you can catastrophize, catastrophize an ingrown toenail. I do. And in any of those places of vulnerability, I find myself leaning on this this narrative of the Via Dolorosa. And I begin to, I, I, I emotionally attach to the reality that this narrative of appalling devastation and annihilation is my destiny too, because I am human and I will pass away. And some little bit of me doesn't like it. Does not like that at all. And then, and then I start thinking like of resurrection. And I don't think of resurrection again rationally or intellectually or scientifically. I don't think like, well, that's completely implausible. No. But I think about it as like the same as I do Tai Chi. In other words, I allowed the idea to embody itself within me. The idea embodies itself within me. And then I'm lying in the bed in the middle of the night and I start thinking of, you know, the resurrection and sharing that one reality that, that we all become the Christ, the one who is resurrected. And that we look forward to the resurrection of the dead. We we kind of live this inner idea that we are here forever. As one with Christ, as sons of light, as children of light, as daughters of light. And in that kind of sense of the beauty of that idea, the beauty of heaven, the beauty of not just all the saints sitting around the corners of the room with me, but but all the beautiful loved ones that went before me. Father, mother, grandfathers, grandmothers, great-grandfathers. God, the struggles they must have been going through in the 1830s and 1840s that I know nothing about. And yet that would have been for them hugely important. That would have been their whole life. And then they let go, do their best. And three generations later, I'm born. Now I'm going through this experience of consciousness. And I'm thinking, I'm one with Christ. I am alive forever. This moment now, when I hear the, when I hear the, 
you know, the clock chime. It, it's not telling me of time passing, it's telling me this moment is eternal. If you pay attention to the depth of this moment, this moment is outside time. This bell, this chiming is like a door into eternity. Listen to it, be still. That's the way I, I do it, like if I hear the church bell on the street or if I if I hear the bell when I'm at the Eucharist and I'm kneeling there in the congregation and that little tinkle goes as the priest comes towards the words of consecration, any of those moments where I hear a bell, when I hear the Tibetan bell, it, it's the same thing. I have the Tibetan bell in the room. I use it. You touch the two pieces of it together and a chime comes out of it, a, a, just a tingle from the, what do you call it, the, the metal in it, and it's so beautiful. It, 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 it draws me into eternity. It makes me be still. The Zen bell. Bells are always asking us to pay attention. So when I pay attention, middle of the night, and I say, let's say, a beautiful prayer... You know the you know the prayer to say I believe in God the Father Almighty Creator of heaven and earth that's called the creed right, and we kind of rattle it off and it, by God it's a huge big bag of old ideas, and you think their ideas are kind of little objects like as I say little things in a bag that's stuck in your head, they're concepts but no they're not. They are ideas that they're kind of they only become true if they are embodied in you if, you, if you kind of experience them through your body. And try this if you like, but just take the first line of this prayer, the creed. I believe in God. Okay? And stop doing it with your brain. Your brain will tell you all sorts of ideas about God. You know, God is eternal or almighty or immutable or he's an old fellow with a beard or he's a woman, he's actually a goddess or something. No, just stop that. Acknowledge that God is beyond all concepts, beyond all ideas. That, that, that no idea in Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, no idea can ever in any way encompass God. Language can bring us to the door, as Rumi says, can bring us to the door, but it can't bring us into the house. Coming into the house to say, I believe in God, you have to check your body in the same way as you do in mindfulness practice. You have to go through a sense of awareness about your, your legs, your toes, your ankles, your hips, your belly, your arms, your torso, your elbows, your fingers, your eyes, your nose, the back of your head, your scalp. You have to go through the whole thing and breathe in and breathe out and feel the, the wonderful serenity of just being in your own body. And then with each breath, pay attention. And you'll begin to realize that belief in God is actually a physical experience. God is touching you. Belief is the emanation. It's a physical, physical awakening. And it, it just ties in very simply with the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of you. The sense that within you there's a dimension of conscious being that is eternal, forever. This is belief in God. And as you open your eyes, you see the beautiful world around you. On these days, recently, there's been very dry weather and it's gorgeous winter light. You see all the mountains and the, the, ta the people around you, the streets around you, the parks, the woodland, whatever, the birds. 
and you realize that this is a veil. You can say it's a veil that hides God's presence, or you can say it's a veil that reveals God's presence. But there's one thing sure. If you start from inside, as I believe in God, then everything outside becomes an intimate caressing. A personal relationship. No tree is any longer an object. Or no bird. Or no human being. And no human is ever an enemy. Because in everything. If you have been mindful and have you used the mantra, I believe in God, as the mantra to take you into that mindful space, you realize that all ideas are embodied. And it's the embodiment of the phrase, I believe in God, that brings it alive. And if you're like me and you have a clock, or you're passing in a street and you hear a clock, like a, a, like a, a clock, like a bell, well, you know it's calling you to pay attention. And I think that's why in the modern age there's so much anger, because there's so much attachment to ideas. Because people are using ideas as some sort of truth. Because you need, you need some sort of truth to possess you. And if you don't choose, if you don't choose God as, as the ultimate, unnameable source of compassion. If you don't allow God to embody you, you'll find yourself going for some second-rate philosophy or ideology instead. Wasn't that a great bell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you don't, you know, if you don't take this beautiful idea of transcendence and allow yourself to be embodied with it, allow yourself to be embodied with the freedom, the freedom of the children of God, everything that happens is going to be okay. All will be well. All manner of things will be well. You are looked after. Even even if the suffering is so intense that you can only relate to the crucified Christ, even then, there's some sense that within every experience we belong to God. We believe in God. And that belief comes through like a, a Tai Chi, like an embodim, embodiment. I believe in God is a physical position. No wonder every religion has some kind of prostration, which we don't use now, I know. But no wonder Islam, Orthodox Christianity, Buddhism, whatever, you just, you got to bow down 
physically. Because there, there's no more clearer way to feel the embodiment that God is within you. In prostration, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, everybody bows down physically. It's a beautiful kind of Tai Chi. Bow the head. Bow before the altar. Genuflect. Make a gesture before an icon. These are all wonderful aspects of Tai Chi. They are a Tai Chi that allows the energy to flow within. The Chi flows. But that's not an idea, that's not a concept, that's an experience. And that's what Tai Chi is. And in the same way, I believe in God. It's a moment in time of physical awakening. Thank you for being here. It's been good to share it with you. Bye-bye.